All right, y'all, let's roll. Hey, um, do me a favor again. Turn, kill your Wi-Fi if you can. Um, you're, all, you're only on Twitter during class, so you don't really, you're not going to use up much of data. So we really need y'all to kill your Wi-Fi because we're testing some stuff out. We're continuing to test, okay? Um, Okay, so first things first. Today, today, bro, today is officially National Coming Out Day, I think, right? So is, did anyone come out today? Is anyone, or is anyone going to come? Are you thinking about coming out? You want to come out? Is anyone, anyone come out who's not gay? You just want to play with people in your family? No. Did anyone come out today? Yeah? Is anyone going to come out today? Today's the day. You can't do it. You've got to wait another 365 days. So that's really hard to go back in the closet for another, another year. It's dark in there. Damn. All right, man. That was your chance. And he's, listen, man. Also, if you're straight and you want to just like kind of try it out, just see, because maybe you're not straight. You, if you come out today, you can just be gay for 24 hours, and then you can just go back in the closet tomorrow. So it's kind of a freebie, you know what I mean? You, and if you're a guy, you, I don't know, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're more likely to get laid or something. I don't know. All right. And in the spirit of coming out day, tonight at... Heritage uh, Hall, I think, in the hub is the student drag show. You should all go to it. It's going to be a blast. And if you're a straight guy and you're like, drag's so gay, I don't know, um, go. You're not going to be gay for going to a drag show. If you are gay after you go to the drag show, you are already gay. <laughs> so just go. You just and support just your queens, discovery. tip them. Go, Hexa. Yeah, listen, man. Actually, drag is historically a straight thing, so it's really cool. If you've never been to a drag show, it's really it's a lot of fun, man. So tonight, it's a lot of fun. Okay. All right, man. That was your last chance. So let's let's bring it in. All right, here we go. We're starting. Um, here we go. So I'm, gonna, I'm starting class sitting on the t table up here because I just I want to say a few things um, just about the class as we're kind of heading into the, the second half or we're fully into the second half of the semester. I'm not really sure, but um, I want to, I said this on the first day, I talked a little bit about this, but I, I want to say it again now that you've had, you know, you've been able to experience half the class. Um, I want to say something about the pedagogy of, of Social 19. And pedagogy is the study of how, it's like how knowledge and skills kind of come together in a classroom environment. And so really it's about how and why people teach in the way they do. So I just want to make a, f a couple points. First, um, a while back, quite a number of years ago, I, I finally admitted to myself that people don't remember facts. And this happened over the course of, of a number of years in, in which I, um, after class or like around Pond or different places, I would visit discussion groups and in particular after what I thought were some really interesting classes and I would ask people about the class and what they remembered and that sort of thing. And what I discovered was that no one remembered anything. Even, even the classes that I thought were actually really rather interesting. And, but no one remembered anything. And, and I st you know, it sort of provoked me to start thinking back to my experience as a student and 
realizing that I didn't remember anything either. And so um, that led me to say, look, I need to stop talking about facts. And with the rise of the, the proliferation of smartphones, it became this kind of thing. It's like, well, if you can look it up on your phone, then why should I talk about it in class? In some ways, it's almost criminal or it's fraudulent for me to come in. It would be for me to put things up on a PowerPoint slide to have you write them down. Like, what's, that's, not, that's not an educational experience of any sort. I could just email them to you and you can stay home and do whatever you want to do at home. So, um, you know, if I, if you, you might, I know a lot of people all the time say, well, Sam doesn't def even define anything or whatever the case is. And it's like, well, look, if you, anything you want to have defined, just pick up your phone and open up one of the browsers, Google, Safari, whatever, and just look it up. And don't, don't rely on me to do that. So that's the first thing. I feel like it's almost criminal to just go into a classroom. It's thievery, actually, to go in and just do that to people. Um, the second thing is that I came to the conclusion that people don't remember arguments, even when they're like laid out really well and thoughtful and point by point by point and theories and that sort of stuff. It's like people don't remember that. And to this day even, what I find is something that, that people read or we talk about or whatever, and then later when people try to kind of put it, send it back to me or t lay it out, I realized that they miss most of the key points, myself included, right? Life is, you know, these things can be really complex. It's hard, I have to hear something multiple times. And so all I want to do is just put out a series of thoughts, once again, to provoke or just like invite people, sometimes provoke people, but invite people to just think, to go think about it on your own. The only way, you know, that you can really do this is to have conversations with other people outside of class. Like you have to have your friends, you have to take something from class and you have to try to remember it and talk to them and maybe argue with them and hopefully find people who have different opinions or thoughts that you do and then have arguments with them or discussions or whatever. Like that's the only way to expand the mind. It doesn't happen in a classroom. It can't happen in a classroom. So the third thing that I would say is the best that I can do is touch on as many issues as I possibly can and not come down on any one side too often. And once again, to be as, to bring multiple perspectives from lots of political perspectives and ideological perspectives. And it's not always easy because you know, things are really complicated and some things I don't fully, un most of the world, the vast, vast, vast majority of the world, I don't understand at all. And theories and ideas and so on. I mean, I've been doing this for, since I was, I don't know, in my early 20s. I taught my first class when I was 24. I walked into, a, it, was, it was a class on cybernetics and human ecology. And I walked into the classroom, I was 24 years old, and I walked in and there were 60 people sitting in a room and they hired me 15 minutes before the class started. And I said, uh, I don't know anything about cybernetics. And the guy said, the, the dean said, ah, that's all right, you'll, you'll do fine, don't worry about it. So I walked in the room and I said, listen, this class is called Cybernetics in Human Ecology. I have not one iota of an understanding of cybernetics. I don't even know what it means. Human ecology, I got. I just took a class on it, but I still don't understand. It was, one, it was a graduate class, but I didn't understand anything. So I said, but you know what? By the end of the semester, we'll figure it out. We'll just kind of walk through it, and we'll figure it out together. And the best I could do today is what I did then, is just try to continue to ask questions, right? And I try to be fair to different sides. I really try to be fair to lots of different sides. I really am all over the place ideologically, so... Um, and I, in that, to a great degree, I have to do because of the live stream, because I never know who's watching the live stream. And people are always, people send me stuff and t tell me all the things, what an idiot I am. And, you know, th th and then they sometimes tell me things I don't know and because uh, and I know I'm an idiot. And so 
this sort of stuff, right? And so I'm careful, but I don't want to be a fool, right? I don't, I don't want to be a fool, so um, any more than I might be. But one of the things I want to say in teaching this class is I sometimes get really disappointed in liberals because to the extent to which I get disappointed in liberals is because certainly in a university environment, I think there's a liberal kind of ideology that's, that's seen as the liberal ideology that people just ingest, especially in the world of race relations, that people just kind of drink in, you know, like that we're all equal. You, you can't even pose the question of maybe we're not all equal or like, you know, that we should have build a wall or that we should, it's okay to take, you know, children and put them in camps or what, I, don't, I have no idea. You can't even pose that question. How dare you even put that out into the room? These are all questions. These are policy questions. These are valuable, important questions, but you can't even put that out there. And so what happens is liberals go along in a college career just assuming that, oh, I got the narrative down, so now I'm smart. And now I get it, and I've been educated, but never ever learning another narrative. And I'm equally as disappointed in conservatives because the conservatives, first off, I'm disappointed in institutions that we don't teach conservatism. So you never really get challenged to be a thoughtful conservative because the kinds of stuff that Trump says, the kind of stuff, that, that's not conservatism. Just like the stuff that the Democrats say, that's not liberalism. And so, but what I find is, but the academy is much more liberal than it is conservative, and conservatives don't get challenged. And, those, and people who are conservatives, therefore, don't learn how to think. Like, you don't learn how to make really thoughtful, careful arguments. And then what I find is a lot of conservatives make these really stupid arguments. And I'm like, dude, that's just dumb, right? At least, at least, at least like liberals follow the narrative so it doesn't sound so dumb because you're following the narrative. You know what I mean? That so many other people are following. But in the conservative world, it's like you don't even get a chance to, to argue with anybody because if you dare to raise your hand in a class and say, oh, wait, well, hang on a minute. I'm not so sure the police are racist. Let's look at the data again. It's like, oh, how dare you even? Oh, my God. Or like, I'm not so sure that, that, that whatever the Me Too movement is a good idea. How dare you say that? And you, and you know, but because you can't put it out there, you, you don't get a chance to really like fine tune your thinking to become a really thoughtful conservative. And so then you just like shut down and then you don't really, again, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't develop your thoughts. And the best thinking, the wisdom thinking is some kind of balance between the two. And I don't know, so that's a... And then conservatives, you don't, you don't challenge liberals. And so like, for example, the other day, just on Tuesday's class, when I asked for people who were kind of really more supportive of the Trump type immigration policies and think we should maybe like uh, close the borders off a little bit. And you know, y'all like, I didn't, nobody came down. No one even raises their hand. And I'm like, come on, I know there are at least a hundred of you in here who would think that. But you know, you think like, okay, what, you know, you learn, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna not challenge, I'm gonna just be quiet, I'm gonna not, you know. And so you don't even come down. And all you had to do is just sit here and just come up with something, right? But you don't. And people are afraid. And I don't blame you for being afraid because you get attacked. But still, it's like, come on, man. It's so disappointing to me. It's really disappointing. The conservatives don't come out and speak more, especially in a class like this, where I really welcome that, right? But then I understand, right? Because what, what, um, uh, what was, what was his name? The, 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 when you, where, I don't, where, where are you, bro? Who, when you said the thing about the Supreme Court guy, what's his name? Kavanaugh? About, you know, a lot of, yeah, bro, when you made the comment about, yeah, well, but there are a lot of, like, Christians who, who get away with crimes and stuff, and you raise Kavanaugh, and the whole room, like, not the whole room, but y'all cheered. And I'm like, like, that's why conservatives are quiet. That's why conservatives don't speak up. But they vote, my friends, and that's why Donald Trump is in office, although they're not really conservatives. They're just responding in some knee-jerk way. I don't know. They just, they just don't like what they see. So that's a thing. The conservatives like, come on, man. 
Second thing is, and by the way, and liberals, stop thinking you're really smart and calling out conservatives on their, on calling out like conservatives as somehow being something. I don't know. When you don't, ah, just, it's just not very, it's not very becoming. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing is, for class, I just found the best thing for me to do is jump all over the place. Whatever I'm inspired to talk about on a given day, I usually plan class on the day of class. And it's best if I do that because then I'm most inspired and I can see what's in the news and that sort of thing. So, um, and life unfolds quickly. There's a lot of stuff going on that I never know what's really happening. So if you've wondered, is there a logic to the way the class is laid out? No, yeah, there is. The logic is what's happening in the news. I try to kind of follow it a little bit and then go from there. Okay? That's pedagogy of social 119. I'm, I'm hanging on by my fingernails mostly. I'm trying to make it interesting. I'm trying to be as, you know, inspire you or provoke you or really inspire myself to think about things in new ways because that's the only reason I'm here. When I stop thinking about things in new ways, I'll, I'll go home. You know what I mean, bro? You got that? I'm just trying to figure this stuff out, man. If you understood how much I don't know about anything, then I'm just trying to pull my head out of my rear end every day. Please, you'd be depressed that... You're paying for this, actually, so. Does anyone have a question before we start class today? Anyone have a question about that or anything I said or whatever? Okay, well, in that case, onward and upward. Uh, all right. <laughs> Seriously, no one's still, nobody wants to come out? Bro. Oh, you don't want to come out. You just have a question. Dude, you're going to come out? Wait. Oh, a question? You can come out and ask a question, bro. I can't believe it. No, I'm not going to, we're not talk, we're going to talk about queer issues in a few weeks, but, um, all right, bro. Why is, why has bipartisanism been lost in modern American politics? Like there's no, yeah. n no one can be partisan about anything, dude. At all. Here. Here's the. It's here's the. No, no. Everyone is. Everyone has to be partisan. Here's the deal, my friend. The entire, in my humble opinion. In my humble opinion, the system itself, it doesn't work. It, this thing we call democracy is just silly. When, when, when the whole democracy is based upon really wealthy, powerful people manipulating people who know nothing about the issues to lean this way or lean this way, and I literally mean know nothing about the issues, okay? So that, like, for example, my vote I think I'm relatively thoughtful about a lot of things. My vote is equal to the vote of the person who knows zero, doesn't watch news, read news, pay attention to things, think about things, nothing at all. My vote's equal to that vote. When you build a system based on that, it's a really tragically flawed system. But what it does is it keeps people at the bottom battling with each other so people at the top can just go ahead and do whatever they need to do. And the more there's, the less bipartisan thinking and activity there is, the more people at the bottom think that they're actually fighting with each other about stupid stuff or that they're not fighting at all. The, the issues you argue, that we argue about are so meaningless and inconsequential. And then people at the top can just be like, hey, okay, got it, or just walk to the bank. That's why, my friend. It's very simple. Dude, you're not coming out, right? You're just asking a question. Do you want to out? Does anyone want to out somebody just like in class who they know is gay and needs to come out? And it's like it's about time you came out. Dude, I outed Jeff actually on the first. 
when Jeff took the class years ago. I don't know how I knew you were. I didn't even know you were gay. I just brought. What happened? So the first day of class, like the first day after I came down because I plugged my phone into these power outlets that don't work. So after class, I came back to get my charger and you were talking up in the front with Laurie. And I just talked to you about whatever the lecture was about and I mentioned it. Half a semester later, this guy doesn't, didn't know my name until the third semester I worked oh, I for him. But he remembered I was gay and mentioned it like three quarters of Oh, yeah, the you semester. came back up and I was like, hey, and you're gay, right, aren't you? And you're like, I am now. I well, am now. <laughs> and I'm you're out mom, now. And I said, do your parents know him? Nope. Does anyone know him? Nope. I'm like, well, they do now. So. <laughs> and look at you. Look at you. See that? <laughs> All right, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's all good, right? It's all good. So, all right, man. Um, do you think you can, like, put that pedagogy in other kinds of classes, like thought-provoking and, like... The ped this pedagogy? Yeah, yeah. Like, do this in other classes? Yeah. I think you should. But, like, um, I mean, those classes, they're mostly based on theory and stuff. They're based on what? Like, theory. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally, and... dude. Yeah, no, listen, even science, right? Science is a perspective. You know, science is a, is a system of thinking. So there's, it doesn't matter, physics, whatever it is, right? You, you could bring it all in. It, everything comes in. Just keep thinking as much as you can outside the box, man. Yeah, I think it applies everywhere. God, yeah. Anybody else? Are we good? Okay, man. Here we go. Uh, all right, so, hey, we have a cool class today, by the way. I don't know if I'll get through it all. I think I will. I, no, I probably won't at this point. Okay, so listen, we're going to talk, we're going to keep talking a little bit about immigration, but in particular, I want to focus on climate refugees. I want to talk about what I think is a really, really, really Actually, you want to know what? I actually think what we're going to talk about today is the most important issue of our lives, in my humble opinion, but whatever. Okay, so here, uh, first thing first. Um, there's a real problem in, in creating... By the way, for those... I don't think I... Don't think I I say negative, that many negative things about Donald Trump. He's really, in a sociology, from a, from a sociological perspective, he's really low-hanging fruit, this guy. So I think I work really hard to find things, like what I said last class, about 60 countries in the world are, have built walls. Why do we only look at Donald Trump wanting to build a wall as somehow this evil guy? Like, what about the other countries? You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I try to find a way to, to uplift him, but look, so one of the, these are some of the words he's used over the past few years about immigrants. And those are not words that you want to use, okay? The, an infestation of immigrants. Look, this is, this is really divisive. This is really a problem, y'all. And just speaking as a sociologist you really want to understand how easily and how quickly this country could fall apart. And we got a lot of guns and we have a lot of anger and stoking that anger is probably not what you want to do if you're the leader. You want to contain it, you want to manage it, you want to deal with it, but you don't want to light a fire under it. Wait, is that a dog? Dog, man. You got to bring him down here. All right, hang on. No, not now. To keep him up there, but I want to meet him. Is it him or her? All right, I want to meet him. Okay. Oh, dude, yeah, we'll put him on the overhead. All right. Dude, all right. God. Okay, here we are. All right, come back. I just did that to myself. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a dog. All right. Now, 
now that you all ood and ah, now we're going to talk about the end of life as we know it. Okay, so <laughs> not for him because he's going to—he's living dog years. So, like, whatever, it's all good. Hey, can you guys do me a favor? Can you really pull your phones out and kill your wireless if you haven't already? I'm really serious this time. Don't just turn them off. Don't just like let them, like, go blank or whatever. It, you know what I mean? Like, really kill your wireless for the next hour. Okay, um, this is not what you want to do. Okay, y'all, right? It, this is a bad idea. All right, next one. Um, luckily, and this goes to the, the jaded, the, those of you who think that Americans are really hateful and, you know, that Trump has really managed to turn this country in a terrible, terrible way. The reality is 65 of Americans think, still think or think now that immigrants actually bring quality, improve the quality of life because of hard work and because of the skills that they bring to the United States. So regardless of all of this, Americans still think positively about immigrants, okay? Are we good on that? So let's not be jaded and let's talk about things the way they really are. Next thing, here we go. Seven and a half billion people in the world. About 800 million people live on a dollar ninety or less per day. That's extreme poverty. 2.1 billion people live on three dollars and ten cents or less. 20,000 children die every day in the world, day after day, week after week, month after month, because of easily treatable diseases and infirmities. Hunger, malnutrition, diarrhea, et cetera, et cetera. 20,000 children every day. 72 million children of primary school age are not in school. Okay? Are kept out of school, mostly to work or because their parents can't afford school. Or one thing, I've, the two young women in Haiti who we support in this class, when they were in primary school, if we hadn't started supporting them, they were going to drop out of school. Very simple, right? Okay, here's my question. Of the 7.5 million people in the world, how many of them, if they could, would leave their country permanently, their home permanently, and move to a wealthier country? They could. Okay, if they could. So they had the means, if someone gave them the means and said, okay, you can do this and make it happen, how many people would leave their home you got a visa, you're going to go. And of those people who leave and go somewhere else, how many would come to the United States? Of the, that's, those are conditions in which people are living in the world. How many of them would come to the United States? How many people in the world would like to come to the U.S.? Come here permanently and live and work, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think? Just talk to the person next to you. Come up with a number. What do you think? You got to come up with a number, man. Out of 7.5 billion people, how many want to come to the U.S.? Damn. All right, so here. So check this out. So how many of you come to the U.S.? Because, dude, you said not very many. Why did you say not very many? I don't really know. It was no, just... go ahead. Just kick it out. What do you think? Um, What's just your gut feeling? 
I think people are more comfortable where they are than coming to something they've never experienced before. You think people are more comfortable where they are yeah. than somewhere where they never experienced? Uh huh. Dude, what'd you say? I think 60, 60 to 70%. 60 to 70%? Yeah, somewhere between 60 to 70. Yeah? Dude, how many did you say? 50%? 50 4 billion. 4 billion? 50? Come on, 50. Say at least 51 or something different than what he said. Bro. 100 million? 100 million? 100 million? That's it? All right, listen, man. Uh, 100 million. Damn. So here's the thing. So I want you to go back and think about this. Think about this idea. How we talk about it and how we hear the president talk about it and stuff, right? So 640, so the Gallup, they spent a lot of money and a lot of time and they went around the world and they tried to come up with this calculation. Now, mind you, it's not a perfect calculation, but these are really smart, thoughtful people. They spent a lot of money on this, trying to figure out how they could do this in a way that they could come up with some numbers to explain how many people, if they could, would leave for a better life. Going to the UK, going to France, going to Spain, Germany, Russia, China, any Australia, might, wherever it is, right? They deduced that up the 7.5 billion, about 640 million people would leave their homes and go somewhere in the world. And of the 640 million people, about 150 million people would come to the United States. So the idea, if we open our borders and said, hey, anybody can come here if you really want to come here, the reality is, this is what you said, people are most comfortable where they're at. I don't know wherever I go in the world, you know, like I, I remember I had this insight so pr profoundly. I was sitting in a square in Puebla, Mexico, and at the time, Mexico, this was about 10 years ago, and Mexico was going through a real deep crisis. And in the central square, I'm just sitting, Lori and I, in the evening, just drinking a beer and watching the town just come out and just stroll. It was just, you couldn't... It was the most amazing, beautiful, the, the most awesome display of life-affirming reality I've ever seen. And I thought that's why people don't want to leave Mexico, man. You leave Mexico because, you, you know, you want to get a job, but you want to go back. Dudes, listen. If you take nothing else from Social 119. These aren't exact numbers, but they're a hell of a lot closer than the numbers that your, you know, your Uncle Al or your Aunt Maria or whoever, the numbers they're going to come up with. If you take nothing else from Social 119, remember that. You can drop the borders and most people are going to stay where they're at. This isn't Everyone doesn't want to come here. You know what I mean? If anything, they're going to want to go to Canada because they have decriminalized marijuana across the whole country. But here, you got to live in certain states. So maybe they want to go to Colorado. But, you know. All right, here. Ready? A couple more things I want to say. Immigrants today... Yo, hang on. Here's some... <laughs> Dudes. Learning English faster, assimilating faster, in better health, lower crime rates, immigrants today than at any point in U.S. history. Assimilate faster to the United States. Learn English faster than at any point in U.S. history. Today. People didn't come here and immediately learn English. People came here and they lived in their enclaves with other people who spoke their languages. The next generation learns. But this idea that we have in Trump is fueling this wrong thinking and wrong ideology. And I'm going to say that. And those of you who can support Trump, that's fine. You can support Trump, but 
But if you support him on this, it's problematic. Because what, he's do, what it's doing is creating wrong thinking among people. Because immigrants are absolutely assimilating. There's no question about that. And so then you have these other issues. Like, anyone know Kenneth Square? Kenneth Square is like little Mexico, right? It's the mushroom capital of the world. $2.7 billion mushroom industry. When you look around the United States, the, U the U.S. has been built on immigrants reviving communities. Thrive, you know, just building these thriving communities. There's nothing like outsiders coming in and just making things happen. And so we're seeing that all over the U.S. Like we've always seen it. It's no different than it always was. So maybe it was Germans and Italians and the Finns and the Scots and so on. But now it's other people. And like, dude, this industry here in Kennett Square, like, oh my God. So this is happening around the U.S. And so when you hear the negative rhetoric about immigration, just keep that in mind, okay? Next thing. Um, another piece I want to point out to you all, right, about undocumented immigration. This, is a, this, is, this photo was taken in Orlando, Florida. This was a rally against policies. of limiting the power of undocumented peoples. There they are. The vast majority of those people are undocumented. It'd be really easy to go and arrest them all, right? Really easy? It's not difficult? Why do you think we don't do it? Why do you think we don't do it? You think about all the police we have? Just pull the police out, man. They, they knew the rally. They called for the rally two weeks ahead of time. Everyone knew there were going to be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of undocumented people in that place and in lots of other cities. And the police never went out and they never arrested a single person. Why do you think they didn't arrest anybody? Dude, why do you think they didn't arrest anybody? Yeah. It would look bad? Nah, dude, come on. Do you think they care if it looks bad? Okay, maybe. Yeah, no, that's not the answer I'd be looking for. Yes, ma'am. What's that? South Florida economy would just crash because if all the illegal immigrants... Dude, totally, just dude. Who, run, who controls policies here? It's business controls policies. Yeah. The government acts on behalf of business. So like we, we're not going to send undocumented people back in a, you know, Trump has his like moments where he has his outbursts and that kind of thing, but then we're not going to do that because business isn't going to allow us to do it. Business runs the show. So you can have your politicians yammering on in any way they want to do, but come on, man. It's like, it's not going to happen. And it wouldn't, and it doesn't happen. And so this idea, when you hear your politicians and our current ones, some of them, yammering away about this, this sort of thing. You're creating divisions, and it's really a problem. By the way, nah, I'm going to pass on this. Yeah, you don't need to talk about that. Okay, ready? Now we're going to talk about something else that's related. Okay, I'm going to sit on the table again. That headline, that first headline is, the he is one of the headlines I heard this morning, listening to the BBC. And so this Hurricane Michael, no one single weather event means that climate change is definitively happening. That's absurd and nobody would ever say that. But when it's one massive weather event after another, record after record after record after record, all of which are predicted and thoughtfully laid out, you got an issue on your hands. And so we've got an issue on our hands. The most recent climate report that came out three days ago? Anyone recognizing that number, 2030? So here's what it means. 
Some of you have heard this in the news. Another climate report, climate change report that's, oh my God, let me explain what that number means. This is the intergovernmental panel on climate change. These are scientists from all over the world who spend their lives studying that. And what they're saying is, if we do nothing but follow the protocols that we've mostly agreed to, although now the United States has even backed out of them, if we did nothing but follow those protocols, where we're at for the, until 2030, if we do what we said we were going to do until 2030, okay, follow what we have been planning to do, we're in deep shit. Like, it's a recalibration moment to say, yeah, we recommended that then, but mm, nah, things have been going way too quickly, y'all right? And now, actually, we need to up the game. And if we don't up the game, and if we don't address this in a more serious way before 2030, we're going to see some things, the likes of which, some changes, the likes of which are going to be absolutely catastrophic for human beings, the way we are currently living. Life will go on, but we are going to come up with some changes that we will not be able to control. Like this hurricane, you know, how many more times can you build the coast? How many more times? How many more before you finally just can't? Okay? That's what the 2030 means. And here's what I will say about that. Look. I'm not a climate scientist at all. By no means. I'm a sociologist. But I want to talk to you today about some things related to this class that are already happening and are going to continue to happen. And I know that most of us don't want to think about this because we want to think, why are we here? Why are you all here, right? You're here to get your degree, to get a job, to get a house, to get married, to have kids, to do all the things that you've been kind of groomed to do. And these folks right here, y'all, the folks here who came up with this right here, who put that report together, are fundamentally saying, don't count on it. Don't count on it. And so now you got to recalibrate. Because you got to say like, okay, I can either do one of two things. I can bury my head in the ground or I can get excited about what's possible about creating the world where this doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So like, my head's not in the ground. It's like pull it out of the ground and think about some things. But here, I'm going to give you a few things to think about. Ready? Number one, climate refugees. The one thing that we see, we already see, we're seeing every year more and more and more, and we will continue to see is the expanding number of climate refugees, meaning people who can no longer live and survive, not thrive, live and survive in the current geographic regions where they live and survive. Everything that's happening in Syria, as an example, is starting with climate change. One after another after another. And so these are folks in Bangladesh. Here's another one. Here's a dried riverbed in Bangladesh. A thriving area. That river's not coming back. That's not coming back. Where are they going to go? Where do they want to go? Where are they going to go? Like, you know, we can talk about building a wall with Mexico and understand we're not talking about building a wall with all of Mexico. All Trump and his team are thinking about are certain partitions of walls at this point, and it's not even a wall. Certain partitions of some kind of structure where many migrants cross over. But of the thousands of miles of land, it's like all at best, all you can do is just cover tiny little amounts of it. So what's going to happen? 
Here. Jeez. Climate. This is actually from a region that I know. I haven't been there, but I know. And they were told, you yeah, look, you don't, don't go to the United States. I mean, please, this is insane. Guatemala has a major campaign going on right now all over the country to say, don't travel to the U.S. The U.S. has paid for it. The Guatemalan government has paid for it, trying to get people to not take the journey and going through Mexico. It's dangerous. You won't make it. The Americans are stopping everybody. They're doing it anyway. And here, let me show you where they're coming from. So this is the, the land where they're coming from. That's the corn crop. Okay? Fertile. So if you know. Here. This summer there's a drought. The rainy season, when it's supposed to be producing rain, and it's not raining. Three months of no rain. Now, I know this region because I just recently wired money down to the family of some friends who are campesinos, who are small farmers on this region, who really don't have money to eat, and they won't have money for the next year. Where are they going to go? If this is your crop, that's what you're looking at, and you have nothing? And you're these guys here? Where are you going to go? You're going to come to the U.S. This is climate refugees. I remember one time when I was in... I was living in Ecuador and I was traveling a lot in the countryside because I was working with the Catholic Church. I, wasn't work I was studying the Catholic Church and I would go visit these priests all over in the mountains. And there was a small drought. It was like a month, maybe six weeks, where it hadn't rained. And you know, when it, again, when it doesn't rain, it's not... It's not like you, you know, if you don't have water, you don't just go to the grocery store or the 7-Eleven or whatever. You turn the faucet on, there's always going to be water coming out. There's no water. You don't have food. If you don't have food stored away, you don't have food. You don't just go to the grocery store. You don't pull your cash out of the bank, your ATM card. You don't have it. And so I was traveling in this little village, and it was raining. And I get there, and there's a big, huge, massive festival going on. And I was kind of annoyed because, you know, rain means mud, and mud's just kind of annoying. I'm just, you know, this, like, American who just, I don't want to deal with the rain. And it's like, ah, shit, you know. And so I show up, and it's like a seven-hour bus ride through the mountains in the Andes Mountains, and it's really crazy. And, you know, I'm riding next to chickens and one side of me and pigs on the other side and I'm just hanging on going like, ah, oh, shit, right? But I get there and there's a big festival going on and I get out of the bus and I'm kind of feeling annoyed, right? And I, I got to go find the, the priest and I, so I asked somebody, what, what's the festival? What are you, what are you celebrating? So said, nothing, we're celebrating the rain and it, and it hit me. It's like, yeah, it means they're going to survive, like people will survive, you know what I mean? And they won't be sending people to the United States or wherever they have to go. And so, just like this, this is 60% of children under the age of five in this kind of highland, western highland region in Guatemala. And this is the region where my friend's family lives. Um, they're deeply impoverished. Like, deeply impoverished. Like, live with chronic malnutrition. So now, bring climate change into the mix. You have a million Guatemalans who are really on the edge of starvation. You got a million Guatemalans, and what are they going to do? They're going to come here. Hey, dudes, let me say something. You can see this is really, this is me as an adult. You can see this is really depressing. Like, I don't want to think about climate change. That's fine. But you don't have to. 
It doesn't have to be depressing because you can't change it. What, what we know is if, if, these, if these folks are right, and I'm going to show you that I actually think that it's probably pretty wise to assume that they're right, even though I know that some of you under your breaths are talking about how the fact that, yeah, well, that's, you know, it's all a bunch of bullshit or it's probably, or we don't know. Listen, man, go get, that's great. Just, you can tell yourselves that and just be happy. It's homecoming weekend. It's like, ah, what the hell? Go for it, right? So you can be depressed. You can be in denial. Or you could actually be the only thing that I think any of us ought to be, which is kind of excited by the possibility of really shifting the way we think about the world and dedicating our lives to creating a world that we really need to see because we either all, we, we're either all going to go down or we're all going to stay up. And so you, you, there, there, doesn't, there can be one way or, or the other to think about this. Here, let me, let me demonstrate it to you, right? Give me... Um, can I... Can I you, can I use the the through that you all right? Can you just stand up here real fast, and and then So here's the deal. You guys ever... Dude, I'm going to need you too, bro. Nah, I don't need you. Just go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Why not? You too. You guys ever hear the tragedy of the commons? You know that? You get it? So here, I'm going to demonstrate it to you really fast. This is how it works. Tragedy of the commons. Here's, here's Here's how it operated. This guy came up with a calculation. So I think he did this in like 1833 or something. And the calculation was, look, if we have a plot of land like this land right here, and you all, all four of you have sheep, right? And every night, the sheep, the, the plot of land is large enough for each one of you to have, let's say, two sheep. And each night, your sheep that you live on, you need these sheep to survive. And each night, you put them out... They eat the grass on the land, and then what happens is then you take them in the next day. Two by two, you bring them out. So there's eight sheep, and they're eating, right? And if one of you brings five sheep out, and then, then that's a problem. It all falls apart. It's got to be two, because the land isn't big enough to, to, for more than that, okay? So what happens is, for example, you all, like, here, just, you go, go, mm, you know what, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to, demo- I'm not, I'm just going to talk this out. I won't demonstrate it. Have a seat again. I was going to demonstrate this, but I'm not. Okay. So here, look. So here's the problem. The moment one of them sneaks an additional sheep out because they say selfishly, let's say that you say, hey, but if I have one more sheep, I can actually, that's one more for me, and I can, my sheep can graze on the commons land, and then it'll be really good for me. Even though we've all agreed that, hey, this can be a problem if you do that, you know what I mean? But you're still like, well, whatever. And so you do, you bring your extra sheep out, and now you've got three, and no one notices it. And it goes on day after day after day. Day after day, and no one notices. And then slowly the commons starts to get eaten away. And the individual behavior by any individual, by one or maybe two or maybe even three individuals, because maybe like you're the only one that decides you're going to stick with the two sheep, the individual behavior where the one person says, hey, but I'm in competition with everybody else. That behavior tips the commons, and then everybody crashes. 
And climate change is kind of like that. Like, there's not a... Every one of us in the room is saying, yeah, but still, okay, I got it. This is going to be a problem. If these folks are right, this is going to be an issue for me. But you're still thinking, yeah, but I want to get a car and I want to buy a house and I I want to have land and I want to have all these other things. I want to fly around the world. I want to do all this stuff, right? So you're still thinking that. So then you can look back to everybody else and say, okay, well, we'll leave it on to them. But each, everybody else is thinking the same thing. We're all in the same boat. And this is the tragedy of the commons. The United States is saying, yeah, but for us, our politicians are saying, but we have to support our people, but our people, we were elected for us to make sure that our people thrive. And the politicians in the other country are saying, no, but we were elected to make sure that our people thrive. And the politicians in that country say the same thing. And the tragedy of the commons is on the entire planet where people start saying, Everyone's acting as individuals in their own selfish way, and it brings the whole thing down. It's really pretty simple. This is happening in prison all the time, man, the tragedy of the commons. All the time, man. Here, let me... I'm going to say something to the climate change, the, the folks who think that the climate change people don't know what they're talking about. So here. Check this out. Um, so I read this newspaper story, this California mom, she was arrested. She let her four-year-old old son play outside alone. Um, that should say alone. It was like, you know, 100 feet from her house. It was a gated community. She got arrested. Okay? Because you can't have your child outside alone. And then this guy, you probably saw, did anyone see this on the news? Got, this is like, you know, you're driving while black, breathing while black, walking while black. Well, he was, the police were called on him because he was babysitting while black. So some woman saw him with these two young kids. A white woman saw him with these two white kids. He's a black guy and she thought, hey, what are you doing with these kids? And he can't be, he must be up to no good because whatever, black guys don't ever hang out with two little white children because, of course, we know that that never happens. And so, so she called the police and, the, you know, whole silly stuff. It was fine. Police, the cop at one point in the video, you watch him and he's just like, oh, God. Okay, so here's my question. Um, and the issue is, the reason I put that up there is because I was reading some comments on some website somewhere and somebody wrote, well, with the, with all the kidnappings and stuff these days and so on and so forth, you know, it's probably safe to call the police. Okay. What's the answer? By non-family members. What do you think? What? C? A or B? Probably B. What do you think? B? Dude, what do you think? B. Listen, the 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 an- the answer should be obvious. Really, it's A. Listen, man. So here's something that we don't know. How do we know? How do we know things, right? Think about all the stuff we don't know. We don't even know this. Think about the amount of fear that we have. A mother is arrested for letting her... It's a gated community. The kid's 100 feet from her front door, which is open. She's watching him. He's in a playground playing by himself. She is arrested. There's 100 kidnappings every year. Come on, man. Seriously? This is the world we're going to live in? And these are, these are people who think they know? 
what's going on and how dangerous the world is, we think we know how dangerous the world is, right? So here, let me go to this one. Smoking. These are advertisements for smoking. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. These are, I remember seeing these things when I was young. Look at 20,679 physicians say luckies are less irritating. It's toasted. So physicians, got to smoke cigarettes. They're good for your lungs. Here, another one is kind of good. Here's Ronald Reagan, right? Gee, Dad, you always get the best of everything, even Marlboro, right? It's like the other stuff. People used to sell it as when you have a sore throat. They put menthol in cigarettes. And then when you had a sore throat, you should smoke the menthol cigarettes because it was soothing on your throat. And doctors support this and everything's fine. And oh my God, all good, right? This is how far we've changed. It's not very long. When I was a kid, everybody had ashtrays in their houses, even if you didn't smoke. It's like in China. Oh, everybody smokes. So many people smoke in China still. You all have like kind of hitting that curve. All right, 98% of researchers who study cancer and heart disease say that smoking will very likely shorten your life and lead to other health problems. Anybody doubt that? Anybody have a question on that? These are researchers who study heart disease and cancer. Got it? Anyone doubt that? Anyone think the 2% maybe are probably, ah, you should listen to them. They might have something to say. Anybody think the 2% are getting their funding from anybody other than the tobacco companies? Anyone think the 2%? We should listen to them? Anybody? Wow, interesting. Okay. 97% of active climate researchers who spend their entire lives studying the climate and changes in the Earth's atmosphere, who publish in peer-reviewed journals, which they do, by the way, they all publish in peer-reviewed journals, conclude that human beings are playing a role, an active role in changing the climate. The consensus is that the impacts of our actions are very likely to be devastating if we do not reduce carbon emissions. Smoking, very likely to shorten your life and lead to other health-related problems. Very likely to be devastating if we do not reduce carbon emissions. Why is it that people don't question that 2%? but they question this 3%. Why is it that I, if I ask you, if I had gone around the room before this class and started asking you all about climate change and what do you think, and that many of you would have stood up and said, well, yeah, I don't know. I don't really believe. It's a science. So, you know, they get their funding from somewhere and make any number of things. But why don't we, why not those folks? Why these folks? It's a really smart, it's the same scientific method, my friends. Really smart people know what's going on. Of course, they're changing things, just like these people. Didn't come out right away. They, uh, this is heart, yeah, heart disease. It took many years for people to kept doing, keep doing research, and they started to clock it in differently. Like maybe you'll lose this many years off your life or that many years. They got a lot of things wrong before they started to zero in on exactly what the issues were. Same with these folks. Why do we find it in our interest to... Why do people question them? How is that? For those of you who question these folks, right here, the science folks, why don't you question these people? Why just these? Maybe it's just because we don't want to think it. We don't want to imagine the unimaginable. And that we want to keep playing in the world of the tragedy of the commons. We want to be in the commons. And we want to think that we can have what we want to have. And so one question I have is, what if there's another alternative? Oh, by the way, just, I just want to, in case some of you are still wondering... These are all of the entities that I've been able to, that I just decided to put together, who accept the fundamental conclusions of the IPCC. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that 
if we don't do something pretty quickly. We're in deep shit. You know, the U.S. Navy has plans to move every single one of its, of its, um, of its Navy bases inland because of climate change? Every single one. The insurance industry, Global Airline, every single one, man. Look at that. They accept it. Maybe your, you know, your Uncle George or whatever thinks it's a bunch of bullshit because he read Reader's Digest. Dude, 1912, right there. Predicted in 1912. So yeah, this is going to happen. So here, my thing, right here. This is what we have to deal with in a class like 119. This is what we're going to have to deal with. Wait, hang on. Can I, I want to leave you on a, po this is positive to me, by the way. There's nothing negative about this. There's nothing depressing about it. It's actually because the sooner we see, the sooner we understand, the sooner that we all, are, all of us can start making individual decisions to have collected, to make cool collective decisions. Oh, fuck me, man. All right, listen, man. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, have a uh, safe weekend and enjoy yourselves.